Welcome everybody to episode 74 of Drum Education Live and today we have Mike Sturgis! Hi! Woo! Great to be here guys, thank you for having me. You've made an old man very happy. <laughs> Yay! Good! Um, who, who is that? Who's that old man? I don't see any I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Just go, go, go along. Me, man, you know, what can I say, you know? Well, it's just a number. I want to know where it all started. It, for well, you. in my case, Philippe, it's a big number. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, moving yeah. on. But it's just a number. It, 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 it is, you know, but numbers, you know, are a thing, you know. They don't matter, though. It doesn't you matter. don't count in like one, two, eight, nine, or whatever. You, you, I, I usually say I'm 18. Numbers. Yeah, I usually say I'm 18 with 31 years of experience. I like that nice framing well, i'm gonna do that age. i'm gonna good. do that as well yeah nice you. yeah this has gone a bit chaotic hasn't it i love it it's all like <laughs> it's all podcasty you know it's, it is. It's, like, it's like what the young people do you know? all right <laughs> I, I wouldn't know anything about that yeah <laughs> But we're not doing the thing by having just audio on podcasts. No, we're not. We're just putting it on YouTube. So there you go. But that's we're the new way to podcast. Full service. I hope that they all appreciate it, you know, and all the work that you do, you know, on this. The, this, this level of production. I mean, you know, it doesn't come cheap. No, no. It's very no you, see I mean, you had to reboot your computer for this to happen, you know. No, so no. there's exactly. a lot gone into this. Exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad I'm not paying anyone by the hour. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'll stop interrupting. Go ahead. It's okay. I, I read that you started playing drums at age 10. So I would like to know a bit more about that. Who were your, you were my teacher. Who were your teachers? So, yeah, I, my, I come from a musical family. Uh, my dad was a high school band director at one point. He did um, leave that profession eventually, but, you know, obviously once a musician, always a musician. And I have three siblings, um, older brother, older sister, and a younger sister. And there was an expectation, uh, and my mom played a bit of piano as well. So I think there was an expectation that we would all play an instrument of some kind. It was kind of one of those things for whatever reason, I just didn't question it. It was kind of like, yes, when you reach the right age, son, you will play an instrument. And it was kind of like, yeah, you know, it's just what you do. Um, and so uh, my dad uh, was a trumpet player. And so I, he made my brother play trumpet. And so I too expected that I would be made to play trumpet. In fact, the trumpet was all lined up for me. And I didn't want this trumpet. Um, and somehow I got it into my head that drums would be cool. Uh, I have, or I had an uncle who was a drummer and he played in top 40 bands and, you know, a bit of a rock and roller. And, uh, he was like a legend in my eyes. And, uh, I think it was probably an influence, uh, but I just started to feel like, yeah, I was gravitating towards the drums. Uh, no particular reason. I just thought it was cool. And my dad really tried to put me off, you know, and he would say, well, son, you know, the drums are the hardest instrument there is to play. And I'd be like, yeah, okay. And, uh, you know, he said, and I've seen so many students start the drums and they just stop because it's too hard. And, you know, so this is the kind of encouragement that I was getting from my own father. Uh, and of course, uh, I was defiant. You know, in my own ten-year-old way. I and think. I, I think he, he. If he wanted to, wanted to discourage you from playing the drums, he used the wrong tactics. He should have said, "They're really heavy to carry around." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and you know, and at my age, he. I would have said, "Yeah, you know, Dad, you were absolutely right, and I did pick up the wrong instrument in the end." But no, I mean, so I uh, I insisted I wanted to start playing drums. And so my dad said, okay, you know, but, you know, I warned you and that sort of thing. So my dad bought me a, a pair of drumsticks to be, because, you know, that was what, you know, a young person should be playing, you know, or using pairs to be sticks. Who knew? Uh, I, I, I got a, a, a practice pad 
you know, which was basically a piece of rubber on a uh, piece of wood, you know, um, and, uh, and a book uh, by a man called Haskell Har. Um, and I can't even remember the name of the book, but it was all about learning the rudiments. And my dad, having some uh, musical knowledge, you know, across a broad range of instruments was able to actually start me on the drums and oh, well on the pad. <laughs> if you like, and, uh, you know, teach me how to play some of the rudiments and get me reading. And so everything I did from the start was um, everything I did with my hands, every rudiment I learned was married to a note on the page. And, you know, so I was just reading simple things and, you know, okay, and today we're going to learn to play a double stroke roll and, um, and then, you know, five stroke roll and pair, you know, like you do. And, um, and I kept at it, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't given in <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, and it went from there and I played for a year on the pad, pad my book. And um, I started to study with a peripatetic teacher uh, who was at my local school. Uh, and after a year, my dad bought me a snare drum, you know, so I earned a snare drum, right? a Ludwig super sensitive, you know, so pretty good drum, actually. Yeah. Uh, I'd like one of those myself right now, actually. I don't know whatever happened to that drum. Uh, but anyway, so I had my drum. I mean, I was loving life, man, with my snare drum. It was just unreal. But of course, at a certain point, you think I've got to have the whole kit. And uh, after another year and me trying to mow lawns and earn money to buy a kit and whatever uh my dad eventually gave in and bought me a drum kit so there you go that was my uh trajectory as a young man cool uh were you frustrated that you you, you had to spend so long on the practice pad and then and then no. the snare drum because you wanted the drum kit no i just didn't know any better <laughs> I just was like you know and i loved i loved the snare drum stuff i you know i just it was really satisfying, you know, to learn snare drum solos, you know, even the stuff I learned at that age, some of those classic snare drum solos, like, you know, the downfall of Paris and, you know, the three camps and stuff like that. Um, I still know today, you know, and um, I, and I still love that stuff, you know, so it, yeah, it was only like after, you know, like I say, a year and a half, two years, I started to think, yeah, I really want to move on now to the, the full Monty. Cool. Mm. And uh, did you, you practice in your house? How was your dad? With yeah. That? So, so, so again, my parents were really accommodating. You know, we had a basement and just set up the drums in the basement, old fashioned stereo, crank it up loud, man, just play along. You know, I mean, they could hear me across the street <laughs> and, and everyone loved it. You know, everyone, no one complained. Everyone thought it was great, you know? Um, and I'd come upstairs from playing drums and <laughs> they'd be watching TV and the TV would be like blasting a lot. And, and, you know, my mom would be, oh, sounding good, Mike, you know? And, oh, that's you know. so nice. So, that's you know, so I was sweet. really lucky, really lucky that my parents were really supportive. And then when I started finally gigging, you know, like they were, you know, they were great. They started taking me to gigs and sitting there and whatever, you know, so. So they were they were very supportive. I'm extremely lucky. Cool. Oh, very nice. Um, I want to know who your influences were back then. I know I think Buddy Rich was a big one. Um, who else yeah. grabbed your attention? So yeah, Buddy Rich. I mean, you could not you couldn't not uh, be uh, you know just absolutely overwhelmed by the guy. I mean, he was when I was, uh, you know, that age, you know, sort of 19, so 10, 10, 12 years old in 1970, you know, I mean, it's like Buddy Rich is at the peak of his powers, you know, more or less. I mean, that he was at the peak probably for, you know, most of his life, to be honest. I mean, but, and he was just, a, just everywhere. You could turn on, you know, uh, a chat show called the, <clears throat> the Johnny Carson show. Well, the Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson. And he would sit in with the big band and, you know, that was a, like a real 
thing, you know, to be able to sit in, or, you know, stay up late and watch that, you know, as a, as a little kid. And, uh, you know, I saw him live about five times. Um, I think, yeah, just the guys that eventually wound up being my teachers. I had some great, um, you know, teachers who, who you know, at, at an early stage, um, you know, were just really helpful. Um, I think rock drummers, uh, I started to get into that. I really started to get into the band Chicago, you know, and with Danny Serafin. Uh, that was a really nice transitional band. Ringo, uh, I mean, I, I, I kind of learned all the old Beatles tunes because my brother, uh, older brother had the albums. Uh, and, you know, so those that was a big influence, uh, you know, and then working my way up to like um, bands like Uriah Heep, uh, Deep Purple with Ian Pace. Uh, Uriah Heep had a guy named Lee Kerslake. Yeah, one of my favorite rock drummers of all time. And, kill, you know, such a good drummer. And I think sadly, no, no longer with us. Yeah, he, he died, I think, at the beginning of this year. He was, he was battling cancer for a long time. Yeah, yeah, which is a shame. But yeah, I, I mean, I used to love... I don't know, listen to Uriah Heap live album, two album set, and same with Deep Purple. Um, so yeah, I mean, so many great drummers uh, to check out. And, um, you know, I was lucky to have a record player. And But um, were you first into jazz or into rock? Oh, uh, the jazz thing kind of um, came, I mean, definitely into rock first. You know, so I, I did that kind of journey through um, sort of Beatles stuff, you know, quite, quite simple uh, grooves. And, and, and then, you know, kind of then, you know, at the time, my friends were into ZZ Top and Uriah Heep and Deep Purple. And so got influenced by that. And then the Chicago thing came and then formed that bridge, you know, like to the Maynard Ferguson band. And, but, you know, Buddy Rich was in a class by himself, yeah. you know, so uh, that, listen to that big band thing that was always kind of in the background uh, as, you know, influencing, um, you know, my musical tastes, I think. And, and you know, I just love that too. And then uh, when I was able to go to start going to these, these uh, jazz camps that were local to me uh, in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and, um, you know, just got to that feeling of playing with a big band for the first time. And I was just totally hooked. Uh, and, and then met guys who were into jazz. And so my first band, so to speak, wasn't, you know, like a rock band. It was more like guys trying to play jazz, maybe a bit of um, some rock, but, but, you know, really um, had, you know, jazz aspirations as well, shall we say. So I, uh, I, I was luckily lucky to to be exposed to a fairly broad musical environment. Cool. Nice. And then you um, you studied in Miami, is that right? Like that that is right. College? Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, yeah, um, not that I've been stalking you or anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> of course not. <laughs> um, and you you got the aha gig like fairly quickly after you graduated is that right i mean yes i mean strictly speaking i got the aha gig before i graduated uh like literally it, it came about because uh I'll, I'll just not bore you with the whole story but a guy that i was going to university with who was norwegian a keyboard player uh wound up getting hired uh, by the AHA guys to play keyboards on their world tour and be their kind of de facto MD. Um, and after some auditions took place in London and they didn't find the rhythm section they wanted, um, this guy uh, whose name was Doug Colesrud uh, uh, was said, look, why don't you bring this friend of mine over from Miami? Everything was based in London, by the way. And he said, why don't you bring this friend of mine over from Miami? You know that's the guy, you know, that you want. And, uh, and then another friend of ours, mutual friend of ours that we went to university with as well, a guy named Life Johansson, who's American, but then he was living in Oslo at the time with his Norwegian uh, wife. And, um, you know, and so we were all brought back together in London and um, we did this little aha tour. Um, so again, you know, just, just very much serendipity and, 
and 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 it's what I would uh, say about that is to anyone listening, still listening, and hasn't switched this off by now. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so I want to say to anyone is, is like if you're at a school, right, an institution of any kind, get to know everyone that you can at that place because. Uh, you never know who is going to help you in the future. And um, <clears throat> Doug, who I became friends with there, um, and, you know, just, you know, played on his recital and, you know, just a, had a great time, had no expectations of Doug ever getting me a gig of any kind. And he came up with, you know, a dream that was a, 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 a gig that was, you know, beyond my dreams, really. Uh, and so, um, anything can happen, you know, and the, the most unlikely meetings can lead to um, amazing things. So that's, that's my first piece of advice to anyone. Yeah, it's a great advice. When I was at MI, one of our teachers, he, he actually was a substitute teacher and, and the, the last lesson we had on that particular discipline called contemporary drumming, he was supposed to play the black page but he hadn't played that for many years. So he had to improvise a lesson, <laughs> but he improvised a very good one when he said, we have people in this room literally from everywhere in the world. Back mm. then before internet, he said, go to the stationary, buy a pad, of, a, a, a pad and, a, and, a, and a pen and get everybody's name and number. The number here in LA and the number in their hometown, because you'll never know what the future holds. And then one day you're in Indonesia, the manager ran out with the, the, the money, but you have the number of a guy who was your classmate and he's gonna remember it and you're gonna call and the, the guy may, they may be able be able to help you and yeah I, to, and now with with social media it's even easier it, yeah. it is mm -hmm. it is uh but but yeah I, I i totally agree with the advice that you received from that instructor i think that's that's excellent um i want to fast forward to now um, you've got just a, a couple lot. of years. A fast forward, but, but okay. <laughs> if that's what you want to do, Kira, let's Come do it. On. Let's, <laughs> fast, let's fast forward a hundred years. I've got all these questions, you see. I'm aware of the time. Um, hey, it doesn't have to be linear, guys. We can go back in time too. We can go back. Okay. I just wanted to ask. I I, I like that approach, and and and. If, I'll just interrupt you re really quickly, uh, and I'll just put in a plug for uh, Bill Bruford. Um, and uh, if, if you haven't read his autobiography, I really recommend it to anyone uh, because he's he's got so many funny stories and uh, just so much wisdom in there. But, exactly. but it really made me think of that because it, his his autobiography doesn't go in a linear way. He yeah. jumps all around the place. So it's more like telling your story, but but in a in a in a way that just is um, yeah, it it just kind of is a little bit more modular rather than you know topic based rather than chronologically based, if that makes sense. So anyway, yeah. sorry to interrupt again. You you interrupt all you like. You're the guest. <laughs> um, so Rettenbacher. I hope I said that correctly. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty close. Kistra, Funkestra releases. Can you tell us a bit about this? It sounds pretty cool. Starting with how, what's the correct pronunciation? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I probably don't say it right either. I, I'd say Redenbacher's uh, Funkestra, uh, but but yeah, it, it, it's pretty much you know. So like to spell Redenbacher, um, it's like you know some people say, hey man, is it like uh, the popcorn? Because uh, there's a popcorn called Orville Redenbacher's popcorn, and the answer is yes. The spelling is the same, so it's R E D like the color, ten like the number, Bach like the composer, E R like the TV show, Red Ten Bacher. Um, and yeah, so Stefan Redenbacher leads a band called uh, Redenbacher's Funkestra. Stefan is a band leader, composer, arranger, polymath. Um, you know, just uh, amazing musician and, and guy. 
endless energy. And uh, we've done quite a few records over the years. Um, and I think we're up to nearly like 4 million streams on Spotify now. Wow. Um, wow. So I'm reliably told. And uh, yeah, so w there's two records out. I mean, there's, I mean, there's, there's quite a few records out, but, but the two latest ones, one is, is called Big Funk Band. And the reason Big Funk Band is, might be of interest to anyone listening to this is um, we, uh, well, Stefan, kind of at my recommendation and with the help of Mike Dolbear, um, brought in some A-listers uh, uh, to, uh, on, on the drum kit to play on this one. So um, I'm playing on, I guess, roughly half the record uh, but um, on the rest of the record are guys like Benny Greb, Stanton Moore, Keith Carlock, um, and, you know, and, and to name just a few. So, uh, I mean, those guys are smashing it out of the park. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's uh, great just to hear those performances. So that's Big Funk Band. Uh, that's one that, that's out right now. And also we have one called the golden switchback now love it what does that title mean i'm not too sure actually but i think it's meant to be sort of reminiscent of you know like the james bond era you know like goldfinger uh and because what this record is it's like all it's all instrumental and kind of big bandy not quite big bandy but but there's a lot of instrumentalists on it uh but it's like 60s styled right so it's it's kind of it's funky grooves but with a with a, a a 60s kind of flavor to it if that makes sense so those are the two records that that we've got out at the moment cool uh oh, yeah. question about those uh, especially about this do, do you perform live with this band or is it just a recording project we, we do perform live. We have performed live. We haven't performed live much uh, over the last two years. I mean, due to the uh, circumstances that we're in, but um, we did a little jazz festival in Christchurch um, in July, and that was fun. Um, and so probably more in the pipeline, but we've been doing quite a bit in the studio. Cool. So, yeah. The, my question is with all these drummers coming in and, and, and playing some songs, um, are you required to to play what they played, or it's like, well, that's what they played in the record. What we do live is what we do live. So, I mean, if we haven't uh, had to replicate those tunes live yet, okay. you know, because the the catalog, the back catalog of the band is big enough to whereby, um, you know, we we wouldn't just say, well, let's go out and play those tunes and, and particularly if they're arranged for a big band um you know so to organize a big band is quite difficult we did our last gig as a quintet oh, okay so uh and we we have done albums as a quintet uh there's one out called uh the hang which i particularly like um and you know yeah we did that one as a quintet and so um yeah if, if we get to that time when we and stefan has uh said that he'd like to do this is organize a big funk band concert and possibly then bring in a guest like one of those guys like you know benny or or stanton whatever if possible so that that's the goal if i wind up having to play any of those tracks as you mentioned uh i mean i will just have to do my best on them and uh you know just you know i've i've had to cover tracks before from live from drummers that I, I can't play their stuff. You know, it's so you just have to do it to the best standard that you can and still have it make musical sense. Mm -hmm. So yeah, only because uh, this is a, a worry of mine because I'm, I'm the kind of drummer that I, I cannot play like anybody else for the better or worse. Mm. Like I can only play like myself. And I had I had to refuse a couple of gigs in the past because people wanted me to be a carbon copy of whoever recorded the music. And obviously, I'm not going to play a ballad with double pedal, but yeah, I'm not going to be playing phrase by phrase what somebody else has. 
mm. played before. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that it really depends on the context. It really depends on who you're playing with and how well they know you and what they want from the music. Uh, if they want replication, so, so be it. Some guys do really want that. Other guys really welcome the fact that it's like, hey, I'm bringing in another drummer stroke musician um, who is really good. I like what they do. I like their vibe. I like their feel. Let's bring that into the mix. Let's see what that sounds like. Um, so it, it, it just really depends. Uh, and, and, you know, I think that every gig, you can only offer up what you have um, and, and just say, and not in a defiant way, uh, not in a way that that isn't um, you know willing to be a team player, but but just just in a transparent way, just honest and 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 sometimes you can kind of you can win people over. You can kind of say, well, you know, yeah, I don't really hear it that way. You know, what was on the road? What do you think of this? You know, or whatever. So sometimes it's how you sell it to people as well. Mm. Yeah, I I had a similar situation where. I was drumming for this guy and previous to me, they had this really tall, just think the opposite to me, like really tall, <laughs> huge guy yeah. who was just like, go, 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 go. And he would just like hit really hard. And I went to see them before I joined the band and thought, oh crap, like I yeah. can't play anything like this guy. Yeah. Uh, what the hell? Um, and for a few gigs, I was like, oh, is this working? I don't really know why, why mm. you got me in here. Yeah. But it just gave it a different energy and it yeah. just became its own thing. But I think sometimes it can be a really worrying thing as drummers. You think, am I supposed to be like the last guy? And it's, um, it's all right to bring something different and add your own thing, because that's all you can do, right? Yeah, well, well said. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of like famous bands um, or bands that, you know, we might have heard of that, that switched drummers and they were. I, I know I know a band that people don't take very seriously, but they changed drummers three times and it changed completely the sound of the band. Kiss. Right. Yes. When yes. they transact, especially when Eric Carr replaced Peter Chris, the band became completely different yeah absolutely bit of kiss uh, trivia there sorry <laughs> no I, I love it great great example i love it I, I i i i don't hide it i'm a fan don't hide it it's great never did never will Good. we've all got our guilty pleasures for yeah. <laughs> okay you can get it out here now you know it's fine we're friends <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll cut that bit out. <laughs> um, right. So many questions, so little time. Go ahead. Shoot them. Um, okay, come on. Wishbone Ash tour coming up. Oh, yeah. Come on. Let's talk about that. How did that come about? Man, Wishbone Ash. So um, I worked with Wishbone Ash uh, in, uh, like, like it was from 95 to 98. I can't remember how the connection came about. It was just like a mutual friend in the business and I was recommended for it. And, uh, and I spent a few years playing with the Mighty Ash, uh, which was fun. And, uh, and, and it, funnily enough, Kira, that's, I left the band because I said, I said to him, I've decided to take this job at a school called the ACM. No way. Yeah, that was in 98, right? Wow. And yeah. fast forward to, to today, and I've kept in touch with the guys over the years because uh, the, the, the drummer who's been doing it for 12 years, a very, very good drummer named Joe Crabtree, uh, inventor of the polynome, uh, just a little bit of trivia there. Uh, but but Joe's a great drummer, and uh, Joe's uh, recently now uh, having a family. And, you know, so he and his wife just had a baby. Uh, and so Joe wants to step back a little bit. And, and you know, Andy called me. So a guy named Andy Powell, who is one of the original members, and, and he runs the band. And he said to me, 
hey, you know, and I know this sounds crazy, but, you know, we're, we're looking for a drummer to do some or all of the UK dates coming up in uh, October, November. And, you know, just didn't, I know it sounds crazy, but, you know, would you be interested? And we just got talking and I said, well, you know, yeah, it, it does sound kind of like fun. You know, I haven't been, been out doing any rocking, you know, for a while. Uh, and and uh, so, uh, yeah, that, that it was just as simple as that, really. So um, I said I couldn't do the entire tour, but we, we worked out a compromise where Joe is doing half and I'm doing half. And this will this will interest you as well, Kira. I don't think you know this as as well, but but with with Wishbone as well, they said, well, we've got a gig in Spain just before the tour starts, and um, and Joe, we thought Joe was going to do it, and and uh, he's not, he's not able to do it. Can you do it? And I and I was still a little bit like nervy about traveling, yeah, you know, with COVID and everything. And this was last summer or late in the summer. And I just said, no, I, I, I don't think I'm ready yet, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll look for a, I'll look for someone for you to do this and uh, guess who I got to do that gig. Oh, pressure. Um... Former ACM student. I can't remember if you know, if oh. guys across Windsor. Windsor, of course. Yeah. I love him. He's like, he's great. He's so good. He's like. Amazing. Windsor's a fierce drummer, you know, and and uh, yeah, he's 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 a a, a great guy, and uh, you know, so I I thought is I I saw Windsor play. Uh, it was this was maybe over a couple of years ago, and he was playing with a Genesis tribute band, which 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 was excellent. I can't remember because there's a couple of them out there, and I can't remember. Uh, you know, apologies to the guys in that band. I cannot remember exactly what they called themselves but man they were good and Windsor just killed it he just totally killed it and I I just thought if anyone will go and learn every part meticulously it will be Windsor yes. um, and and sure enough he did and he, he went out and he did the he did the gig in Spain smashed it um, and you know he's actually Joe had to, has now had to drop out earlier than he thought and so Windsor's going to pick it up for a couple of gigs before I step in. And then Windsor, I, I believe, is going to do some dates in Europe in the new year as well. So I feel yes. good that I've, I've been able to hook up uh, Wishbone with kind of what appears to be, you know, their next uh, uh, more regular drummer, if you like. Cool. That's so cool. So, yeah. And, and you know, it just gets back to that teacher-student relationship as well. Uh, and, you know, like Kerry, you and I are talking now and it's, it's great to see you and it's just great to be in touch with people and, and uh, periodically I just hear from so many different students uh, who I've had the pleasure of working with over the years and they're doing something great professionally or they might, I've even had calls, it's like, hey, you know, this sounds crazy, but could you debt for me <laughs> on a gig and, and, and and I like to try and give it back. If I know if there's an opportunity, I like to try and give it back as as well. So it's um it's a really nice thing. It's it's um you know in terms of all those years of teaching to have those relationships and retain those and and have that kind of currency. It's uh, it's very special. Hmm. That's lovely. Um, I hope this isn't too personal, but when you made the decision to go to ACM is that because of family stuff is that because you wanted to have a family I, well yeah we we had already started our family in fact so we we uh we had uh, our daughter was already born she was like two and our son was on the way and uh I felt yeah you know I had you know I was about 35 30 no gosh what was I I was 38 even and so I thought you know I've been doing the freelance thing and been on the road for a while and um you know maybe this is the thing you know I, I, and I, and by the way then so it, this teaching thing for me started to happen a few years before you know where someone talked me into uh just speaking to the management of the what was then called the Musicians Institute in Wapping um and you know so that was a really cool 
place. Um, some great people were students there uh, at, at, at the time. And, and uh, there's some great teachers there. Thomas Lang was teaching there uh, uh, as well at the time. I, I still remember when Thomas arrived at the school and started teaching, it was like some dude from another planet arrived. And <laughs> honestly, I mean, he just would be warming up and playing. I'm just like, I, what, what even is this? I, I, I don't know, this is, this is nuts. Who is this guy, you know? And of course, you know, he's gone on to do, you know, okay in the music business. Um, and, and, you know, so that was a fun thing. And um, so I'd been kind of building up to, and then all of a sudden, again, talking about serendipity, talking about being just being on good terms with people you work with. I had been doing nothing, you know, after um, at that point, uh, I was doing a bit of teaching, but I had no gigs. Um, I'd just done an album with a band called Asia, but they weren't touring, they weren't doing anything else. I was just sitting around, not doing anything. And I answered a, an ad in a in a um, in an old newspaper. It's called Loot. It was probably way before your time. No, I remember. I remember. Yeah, and 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 someone put an ad in there. It said to the effect, "Vinny, Dave Weckel, where are you? We need you for our band." And I thought, "Oh, I like this guy's sense of humor, so I'm going to call him." And you know, th this this guy uh, was a great nice guy bass player and you just said well I've, I've just got a little covers band and we want to play some pubs and but you know we're getting going and where are you based you know so i was based in westland where are you based Erith. it's like do you know where Erith is yeah i mean it's on the way way the other side of london you know and it's like Erith. god okay and i was just learning to drive over here at the time uh or just getting my license and whatever and so i thought well I've got nothing else to do you know so i'll go out to earth and play with this band and you know we had fun did a couple pub gigs and whatever nice people but while i was in that band um the bass player said there's this guy you know that i know his name is james porter and he's um right now he's the head of uh, drums at a place called the acm in guilford i don't know if you've ever heard of it but i think he's leaving you should you should maybe just check it out and see if uh they need anyone and i was like at the time i was living in uh wimbledon or southfields even and it was like guilford oh, gosh that sounds like a bit of a long way away but uh all right well okay and i just kind of followed up this lead um and it's like uh well yeah we're we're looking for a new uh, head of drums who are you and what have you done and, and i like well i told them and they're like would you like to come down for an interview I'm like yeah that was it <laughs> that was it you know that's how i got started at the acm cool wow so I mean, uh, yes. Yeah, sorry, sorry if these stories are boring, but but uh, they they no, just make not. never. We love stories. We are all they, about the stories here. They make. Yeah. I, I'm just trying to make the point that it's it's so much about serendipity, but it's it's also about um, putting yourself out there, and you know, yeah, it, a lot of it is is by seemingly by chance, but if you're putting yourself out there, you're you're just you're just following up every opportunity within reason you're you're being professional as you can in every environment you stay in touch with people you never know what's going to happen i think it's very important two things it's first of all it's it's the relationship because you know sometimes the most unlikely unlikely situation will lead you to a great job and the other thing, which is very important nowadays that you pointed out is putting yourself out there because mm. people are so much into the social media thing mm. that they forget that there is something called live music. Mm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Old school. Exactly. <laughs> I know. <laughs> there was a time people, we left our houses to play. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Back, Remember yeah, it well. Back, back before the wheel. <laughs> out, you know. Let me change subjects completely and ask you, what's the Drum Gym app? Oh, I mean, Drum Gym app is, uh, again, uh, I'm not sure how 
um, Adam Beaumont, uh, who runs uh, Leaf Cutter Productions. So Ad Adam Beaumont is the, uh, you know, he's the programmer, he's the coder. Uh, and he, he's just this great guy. He said, well, I just do apps and I do them in all different kinds of fields. And, and I'm really into doing music ones. And, you know, your name came up and, you know, would you like to do an educational app of some kind? And what do you think? And, and I wasn't too sure, but yeah, it was, it, it's all about the rudiments, basically. It's just like if, if someone uh, just felt like, how do I how do I learn systematically learn each root of it? Uh, that's what this app is trying to do. So I talk about them, I demonstrate them. There's kind of like a little graphic that kind of shows you know the sticking and stuff which Adam came up with and quite quite cool. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's it's about learning the, the rudiments. It's about putting them together in kind of different combinations, and it's about contextualizing them onto the drum kit. Uh, and, you know, just, just to kind of get people started. And, and uh, the app was developed eight years ago now, on, you know, which is unbelievable to me. But yeah, I mean, it's it's still out there selling a few, you know, every month. And, and uh, you know, so, so th that's really satisfying. Nice. And it looks like it's got this cool feature, because I had to check it out, obviously, uh, that you can slow things down if you, want, if you need to. Yeah. Right? Yeah, you can. yeah, you can slow down and speed up. Um, so again, I would just give Adam all the credit for that. I was just the guy who had to, you know, be able to speak to camera and, and demonstrate the stuff. The most um, important thing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Dime online. That's what, yeah, that's where you're teaching now. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's where I work. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm not a teacher per se. I've, I've moved up in, in, into the world of, you know, management, uh, so to speak. Um, but um, so, yeah, I mean, our, our, our head of drums, our main drum set teacher is a guy named Paul Elliott, who is a vastly experienced educator, great drummer. He's been in the UK scene, um, started off at Drum Tech for many years. And, and you know, but he's a very busy clinician and he's written his own books and etc so check out paul online so paul ironically has you know written you know most of the curriculum a guy named uh gabor dornier uh also wrote a lot of the curriculum and and uh, you know was teaching for a while so between those two and and i've you know kind of worked with them on it um in a managerial sense uh and uh yeah, so I mean, it's all online. It's it, it's it's basically um, you know higher education credits um, and uh, being able to do it you know completely uh, asynchronous uh, you know so all with um, content that's completely self-contained in a in a virtual learning environment. Uh, so um, it's yeah, it's, it, it's one way of studying um, that uh, you know like like going to school, so to speak, being part of an institution uh, where you can do it flexibly and not have to attend on a campus. Cool. What do you think is missing uh, from drum education today, if anything? I'm going to, yeah, you did ha ask me to have a little think about this. Um, and my honest answer is it's hard to find something that's missing per se. Uh, in my mind, because I think that any way that you, if you try and imagine a way that you want to study and you think would suit you the best, it's pretty much out there. Um, if you want to study at an institution, you know, obviously you're spoiled for choice. There's so many out there and, and so many that, that have a different um, uh, kind of uh, specialism, if you like. Um, and you know, if you want to study one-to-one, -one, Again, you're spoiled for choice. You can do it online if you want to. If you want to use an app, you can. If you want to use a subscription service, you can. If you just want to go and ferret around online and gather up free content, you can do that too. You know, you'll never see it all because it's just there. It, there's just so much out there now. We are absolutely inundated with content and teaching, you know, from a variety of different sources. So, um, so what's the problem? 
Um, so uh, in, in one way, you could say nothing. There is no problem. Uh, I, 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 on the other hand, I, I would just say, you know, a, 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 as a, you know, an old timer, uh, you know, just a word of caution uh, is that, you know, because, um, you know, because we have so much content, I think sometimes you need a navigator. You need uh, someone to curate content for you, or at least, you know, consult with like-minded people. If it's not just one mentor, you know, a teacher, so to speak, uh, it's 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 it, it could be a consensus of of uh, um, friends, colleagues, other great drummers, um, and you know, just to be able to form kind of a meaningful study path for yourself, so you can kind of cut through a lot of the noise because there is so much out there that, that it's it's easy as we know to fall down a rabbit hole and just uh, start trying to you know pan for gold so to speak out there on the internet so i think that's important uh and and it's not to say someone can't do this on their own and just enjoy the experience and, and still get a lot from it but um but i i think that you know cu curation thing is is really important and then the second thing i'd say is is uh uh, context. So to be able to uh, take this stuff that so, some, of, some of it is just absolutely fabulous, and you can be learning things, um, you know, from, say, a subscription service, uh, or, you know, uh, like a manufacturer's website or whatever, and learning just amazing things, you know, online in, in the comfort of your own studio. Uh, <laughs> and you can be doing that and, and thinking, yeah, this is, this is awesome. And, and it's kind of like, Okay, but don't, I think as Philippe, as you alluded to, there is this thing, you know, about like actually working with people. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it, it, it is an entirely different experience, as we know, when you start to take some of these hot licks or cool, groovy, funky patterns or whatever, and you think, I'm going to try and stick that in somewhere and pose that on the music somewhere and people are going, what you know and, or you know or it just doesn't quite feel right when i was yeah. like when i was doing it with a backing track you know it doesn't exactly. quite feel the same for some reason so that's really really important that you learn how to contextualize that stuff and and uh, you know you don't you learn how to use it uh, musically you know and and you know where the boundaries fall on that is is you know that's a, you know you can just talk about that that's a lifelong journey right? You know, you're making good musical choices. Um, and it's all very subjective, and it depends on who you're working with, blah, blah, blah. But, but, you know, it's something that you do need to be mindful of. And it's the guys that can do that and can do it con consistently, you know, like, you know, your Ash Sohn or, you know, many, uh, Neil Wilkinson, many other great drummers. These guys are just so, you know, they've got chops, but, you know, they just know how to make music. They know how to just make something feel good. And and it's kind of like at the end of the day, that's what it's all about, you know. So that that would be my other piece of advice is don't forget to um, put this stuff into practice wherever you can. I mean, not everyone always, I mean, I'll probably never be good, you know, like like authentic at playing Latin music, so to speak, because I just don't have the opportunities. And I don't pursue them, you know, to get out and, and play with a band, you know, of, of that kind, right? Uh, it, it would just have to be something that I just fell into somehow. Who knows? It could happen, you know, I mean, but but I, I don't actively pursue that. I, I kind of feel like I have my niche and my comfort zone. And even with within that, there's so much to learn um, and so much that I find um, it, it, one of the things that I'm, um, you know, just round this off, you know, but um, I, I do with Redenbacher's Funkestra, uh, one of the things that we've been active over the last two to three years is something called the Masterlink Sessions, and, and that's uh, where we've been getting together as a band and playing uh, in this little studio in Send called Masterlink Studios, run by a guy named James Welsh, uh, and we play the stuff live all together, all in one take, in one room, and we video it uh, fantastic videographer named Leo Mansell. Um, and basically we just put them up there, you know, and so you can go into YouTube and just put in master link sessions. And I think we we're pushing about 70 videos right now. We just did one. Uh, we've done, had some great people in, but we just did one last week with uh, a lady named uh, Mutia Bueno. And uh, she uh, was in the Sugar Babes. 
and uh, yeah, so we did a couple of tracks with her and she just smashed it and it was just like a, such a joy working with her uh, not only because she just sounded so great as a singer but she's just a lovely person and total pro just came in just really professional so sorry to be yakking on but that those sessions and learning to play quietly in those sessions and learning to play a range of things where I stay out of the way and have to get it, man, in one take, you know, with a short amount of time, um, that that's a real challenge. And, uh, you know, and, and you listen back to this stuff and you think, well, what's the big deal about that? But, but it, it, it's like in the moment, you know, you, you've got real time constraints, you've got um, just, you've got a musical question that you need to answer. Someone's coming in there as, a, as an artist and you, you need to find the right part, man. You, you can't just play anything. So you gotta find something that's working with everyone. You've gotta learn it really quick and you gotta play it and play it perfectly. And, and everyone's gotta do it together. It's, it's a real challenge. And so we've, we felt like that's really been a, a wonderful thing to be doing uh, for all of us as musicians and, and it's been fun and it's help, helped us grow. Um, so, sorry, I've been talking a long time. I'll shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> that's the whole purpose of it. No, You're talking a lot. It. Love it. Thank you for your, your gold, your wisdom. We love it. It was great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you thank guys. You. It's, been awesome uh and thank you for doing this podcast and you know and uh you know spreading the love to to drummers everywhere we try yeah <laughs> <laughs> nice thanks so much take care, care. Bye. see you bye